This is Danny Bobro, president of AIM Dental Marketing, welcoming you to this very special installment of the Practice Perfection web-based education series. Today is your opportunity to hear from not one, not two, but four of the top implementers of the integrative dental practice model. And it is a distinct honor and privilege to welcome these true pioneers and trailblazers of this model and mindset. Peter Evans, DDS, MAGD, is a practitioner, author, speaker, national dental coach, and a fellow founding member of the American Academy for Oral Systemic Health. He is president of the Biocompatible Dentist, a company that provides education and resources for dentists about whole body dentistry. James Highland, DDS, is founder and president of Orovital and Biofilm DNA. He is a graduate of the University of Toronto and held memberships in the Ontario Dental Association and the Canadian, I believe that's Canada Dental Association since 1976. Served as president of his local society and was active on their boards and committees for over 30 years. In 2007, Jim became the first dentist to open an oral vital clinic utilizing antibiotic rinses and bacterial testing to treat periodontal disease and breath odor. Roger Price is a respiratory physiologist, integrative health consultant, and the creator of the Breathing Well Orthopostural Program, designed to address below the line issues involved in dental and sleep disorders. He serves as coach to dental professionals worldwide, teaching and training dental teams to deliver stable patient outcomes, and was recently a presenter at the Coice Center in Seattle. And Doug Thompson, DDS, is a leader in using the latest developments in dentistry to provide whole body wellness. His integrative oral medicine practice is a team of professionals with a keen awareness about how oral conditions affect the lives and overall health of their patients. This knowledge is the backbone of their progressive disease prevention and management approach and led in 2016 to the launch of the Wellness Dentistry Network a community of dentists delivering wellness-based dentistry worldwide. He is a clinical instructor at the Coice Center in Seattle, Washington. I've had the pleasure of hosting all of these distinguished professionals on previous installments of Practice Perfection. Today, I'm particularly excited to have them all here at one time to join us for the first of what we anticipate, based on today's turnout, will be many future presentations utilizing this format. Before we get started, I want to remind you, as always, that Practice Perfection webcasts run for 90 minutes. While attendees are in listen-only mode, we invite you at any time to submit your questions or comments using the question button on your screen. We will allow time following the presentation to get your questions answered. Attendance at this presentation entitles you to receive one and a half hours of continuing education credit. Shortly following the webcast, you will be emailed a brief survey with instructions on how to receive your CE. Participants are cautioned about the dangers of incorporating techniques and procedures into their practices if the course has not provided them with adequate clinical experience to allow them to perform it competently. And with that, I would now like to ask each of our panelists to update us on their current body of work, following which we'll open up the discussion and field questions from the audience. Let's begin with Dr. Evans. Hello, Peter. Hey, howdy, Danny, how are you? I'm well, thank you. Good, pleasure to be here tonight. Uh, you want me to just go ahead and start? I would love if you would just go ahead and get the ball rolling for us. Well, uh, when we talk about this, the three C's, I think what I can bring to the table, um, most importantly, is uh, the communication, the third of the C, because uh, without getting to communicate with our patient, know their wants and their needs. Um, we don't get our best dentistry off the shelf, and we've got a lot of that to cover tonight about uh, our, our modalities and our procedures and our protocols. But I think um, the one thing that I can bring is 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 the, the idea of you know how do how do we how do we have a patient um, perceive the need for our care in the first place and to uh, accept what we're saying move forward with it with our best biocompatible dental care. And I think it all started 
uh, in dental school, I think many dentists are still stuck trying uh, to get new patients to accept their best care with the strategies and the methods that were intended for uh, institutional and, and academic environments. So our current skills for presenting cases um, and, the, and the acceptance that were learned by our professors in dental school, you know, we sat down with the patient. It was a process of educating the patient to our way of thinking. And we were required to formalize everything and memorize it surface by surface, tooth by tooth, quadrant by quadrant, memorize it for the presentation of the patient. And I'm, I'm sure this was perfectly logical to all the professors in academia because um, it was a step one, two, three for all the procedures. It, the same, same format was reproducible uh, and they did it for case presentation. So we just determined what the patient needed, told them how we were going to fix their teeth. Um, we gathered all that clinical inf information, went on to the diagnosis and treatment planning, right into definitive treatment without understanding the wants and the needs of our patient. And that was the academic course in, in sales mastery in dental school. We had no clue we had to uh, tie the, the, the patient's emotions into our presentation. We thought that this was like a cognitive skill, right? At, at case presentation, we're going to teach them how we're going to fix our teeth. And we'll talk about that a lot tonight about are we looking at somebody's health or are we just looking at their teeth? Because if you approach your new patient examination in the dental school model, you're never going to get past teeth and gums. You know, the dental school exams, um, they didn't require you to develop any relationship of trust or understanding. You didn't need that. What you needed was to meet clinical requirements for the graduation. You know, like so, uh, something like long-term relationship building 101 was not offered. You know, you never thought about dentistry for whole body health because the professors didn't ask about any questions on it on the exam. So it didn't take a lot of skill to present a case to a patient who comes to the dental clinic for one reason. They signed up for inexpensive treatment. You know, they needed good, keep, cheap dentistry. You needed credits to graduate. The patient wasn't there for a relationship and neither were you. Uh, they had no clue. They had no choice. They had to accept the treatment plan because if they didn't, you'd just move on to somebody else. They'd be out the door. You needed the crown, the, the root canal. Uh, building long-term relationships had nothing to do with it. But in private practice, it's absolutely critical. So we're going to talk That's a lot. That's so true. About, yeah, we will because, yeah, I mean, we talked about the three C's uh, as the paradigm that we choose to uh, to frame this discussion, clinical collaborative communication. And, you know, you couldn't put it better, Peter. In, in dental school, what do you learn? You learn clinical. And I actually, I've been at this for 28 years in this business. For the first several years, I really didn't understand how in good conscience a dental school could churn out a bunch of people that were, were graduating, not just to be dentists, but to be successful business people without coaching them on business. And then I realized, as you just acknowledge that there there aren't any questions on long-term relationships uh, on the board qualify on the board exams and and so yeah the the school exam that you're taught does not prepare you for working with uh, anything other than a truly captive audience i would say and, and it's likewise teeth and gums too we don't get past teeth and gums in a captive audience that that has to accept our recommendations otherwise they're out the door so we are limited very much in our in our creativity uh, in in uh, dental school case presentation and diagnosing for whole body care right absolutely and uh, even on the clinical realm it's been you know as we're learning it's it's been quite limited to just the teeth and gums which has also done the our patients a disservice so thanks very much for getting us started off in that direction peter uh, jim Jim Hyland with Aura Vital. Uh, you're next. Thank you very much for the opportunity, uh, Danny, to join this group and to participate in the forum. Uh, I will declare a conflict of interest in the some of the comments that I'll make because as president of Aura Vital and a, a dentist using the product, I will be recommending that you uh, you do consider these. Uh, I want to just correct. Um, I am one of four founders with Aura Vital, but Ann Bosey uh, Research is the foundation for what we're doing, and so that'll be in the background of what I'm saying. Uh, Following on what was just said, um, we need to talk about uh, the conditions we treat as medical conditions, not as a little bleeding. We need to set ourselves up as being different and to talk about wellness and overall health. And so I ask my patients, what would you do if your physician found some blood in your urine and told you instead of checking it in, th in six months, we're going to check it in three months. And there isn't a patient that doesn't give me a sly smile and say, I think I'd find a new physician. 
And then later on, when I demonstrate, as I'll discuss the papillary bleeding score, I ask them, are we going to observe this now in three months or do you want to treat it now? And uh, it puts the patient in an awkward position and one they want actually uh, want to answer yes to, they want to stop the bleeding. So I want you to, us to focus on trying to talk about the overall care of a patient, not focusing on the teeth and gums. Talk about the fact that you're a physician of the mouth. And I do ask them what type of dentist they'd like working on them. Would they like the mechanic that fixes things or the person that helps them solve the problems so they can save their money or teeth? And most of them look at you a little different. You then have to have a discussion with them about three things that you need to accomplish to help them get healthy if that's what they'd like to do. And the interesting thing is these are the first two are non-clinical. Um, we have to inspire and motivate our patients to want to get healthy, not to that they need to get healthy, but they choose to get healthy. And that's very difficult to do unless you can emotionally engage with a patient. And so you have to help them understand what's in it for me. And again, I'll get to the papillary bleeding score in a few moments, but that's the number one way of demonstrating uh, that they have an infection. Number two, we have to demonstrate home care techniques that actually work. And our statements, brush your teeth, floss your teeth, and have your teeth cleaned, do not mention bacteria, do not mention biofilms, and do not mention gums. And so 80% of our patients have gum disease when they brush their teeth, floss their teeth, and have their teeth cleaned. And so what we do is we tend to do it more frequently. Uh, it's a bit like someone that doesn't understand the language and we yell a little louder. It doesn't help. You need to do good, things good. differently. Okay, and so the final thing is we have to create an environment in their mouth that they can clean and maintain. Now that's whatever dental procedures that you're going to do, be it getting rid of decay, closing contacts, removing infected wisdom teeth, getting rid of the scale and tartar, the stain, it needs to be removed, and then they have a pocket they can maintain. So we need to teach them ways to clean between their teeth that are different, and that only way to do that effectively, according to uh, a recent study by Capel, where he looked at 1,100 uh, studies on it, is to teach them to use interproximal aids, and the last thing that you want to teach them is to floss. The challenge with floss is floss is wonderful to clean pontics, it's wonderful to clean uh, abutments on uh, um, on part on um, implants, it's good to clean teeth, but because your your gum is in a C shape, which is the inside of a bowl hugging a tooth, uh, you cannot adapt floss to the inside of a bowl. And try as you might, you can't push the floss against the gum, so gingival biofilm remains undisturbed. This then leads to how do you test to see if a patient's healthy? There is no standard in dentistry for what's healthy and what's diseased. There's absolutely none. And every dentist and every hygienist in every practice has their own standards. I propose four. Uh, they're very simple. And one of them is uh, to disclose every patient on every visit so you can show them where the bacteria is that's causing a problem. If they can't see it, they can't clean it. Second, you'll demonstrate to them how they'll clean that and you put a brush in your hand and in their hand and help them clean their mouth. Second, you're going to do a papillary bleeding score where you'll take a soft pick or stimulant to push between the teeth and push firmly. People are scared that that's going to cause gum recession and recession may occur, but not from the pressure of the stimulant, but because the tissue goes from, uh, as I call it, beer belly gums to six pack abs in about three days, the bleeding stops. Patients will bleed tremendously when you do the papillary bleeding score. It happens every time you scale, when you scale, it starts to bleed. They tell you using a sharp instrument, stop pushing so hard. But if you can demonstrate that bleeding before you pick up an instrument by rubbing it on their chin, the inside of their lip and on their labial tissues, and it doesn't hurt or bleed, they then believe the instrument's not causing the problem. At that point, you have to link this to the medical condition and to an emotional concern. And so you might ask them when they're bleeding, are they kissable? And at that point, for the very first time in their lives, the patients look at bleeding and gum disease as something they want to get rid of. And they look at you and they say, how do I stop this bleeding? And then you have to go to the heart even more and suggest to them that when they're kissing, they're spreading their blood and their saliva that contains the bacteria that cause this infection to those that are closest to them. And when people kiss them, if they have this infection, they have an open wound that the other bacteria, viruses, HPV virus or oral cancer can get into their system. And at this point, the patient is no longer thinking about their insurance. They just want to get healthy. 
but if you're going to tell them to brush their teeth, floss their teeth, and have their teeth cleaned, it will not work. You do need to do a periodontal charting to record the pocket depth. You're aiming for something in the range of four millimeters. And finally, uh, just give me a second. Um, Sure. I'll come back to it in a moment. Um, the, you have to count the number of bleeding points. We always say uh, there's bleeding on probing, but you have to count the number. You need to know the score in the baseball game, and you're going to record those results and compare before and after. You want no visible biofilm on disclosing. You want pockets that are four millimeters or less. You want zero when it comes to papillary bleeding score. The tissues should never, ever bleed. And on the third day, I guarantee patients that will happen. And finally, on the bleeding on probing, I'm looking at getting less than 10. It's almost impossible to get zero for most patients, especially in the first few months. Uh, but if you get less than 10, you're in good shape. Consider doing a different type of objective test as opposed to, me to just measuring pockets, looking at x-rays, recording recession, doing calculus. Let's look at the bacteria and consider doing uh, DNA or gram stain testing to look at the type of bacteria, the quantities, and even the location of the bacteria to determine the degree of risk the patients have because these bacteria are directly linked to medical conditions. We find F. nucleatum in nearly every single uh, colorectal cancer. We find uh, P in every squamous cell carcinoma in the mouth and in 82% of esophageal cancers. We find 93% um, of patients that have um, Alzheimer's have one of five oral spirochetes in the brain. We find every blood clot and stroke uh, contains uh, portions of PG and AA, either live bacteria or parts of it. And so we need to test for the presence of them. If you do find these type of bacteria and, uh, ble and uh, DNA testing and clinical results, we can consider an antibiotic, I suggest, and we might explain it later in a little more detail, the use yep, of an antibiotic will. mouthwash, uh, which is a yep. spit protocol as opposed to swallow, that will deliver 3,000 times the concentration of antibiotic with absolutely no systemic effects, and at that concentration penetrates the most resistant biofilms, not only under the gum, but the back of the tongue and throat, which never get cleansed and which reinfect the, the mouth. And finally, you should be able to guarantee your results. You should be able to say, if you do what I do, you will get these results. And with the Orovital this week, we're introducing that, and we're guaranteeing an 87% reduction in bleeding on probing and a 79 to 84% shrinkage in pockets in four weeks for patients that are eligible. Um, if they follow the protocols that we do. So I think there's hope for clinical, collaborative, and communication in that uh, system, and we can expand on it in a few minutes. Uh, that's what I wanted to comment on. Thank you very much, Danny. Yeah, thank you, Jim. Very uh, detailed yet succinct, and I like how you tie it with a nice bow that if you do all this, you should confidently be able to deliver a guarantee. It kind of reminds me of when I was in uh, the health club industry, fitness industry. I, I loved it because I knew I could stare anybody in the eye and say, I can give you a 100% guarantee that you will get results here. And of course, you know where I'm going with this. The only thing you need to do is show up. Yes. <laughs> you need to practice the protocol. And if you do, you will have results because we're all made of the same stuff. Now, obviously, we're learning that some people have uh, different bacterial load, which, uh, you know, predisposes them to weight gain and, and whatnot. But in general, if we work our plan, and uh, we can do it. But we can't tell people to do it. They have to want to do it. And they have to the want recurring, to do Yeah, the recurring theme here that I think is going to pervade our, our, our discussion this evening is it's really more psychology than, than dentistry in many cases. It's, it's uh, engaging absolutely. the patient, you know. And with that, uh, we have another... Uh, distinguished expert to to discuss that and more with us, and and that's Roger Price, who is our our resident respiratory physiologist. And uh, so, Roger, if uh, if you wouldn't mind updating us on 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 your work and and trying to tie it all together with the clinical collaborative and communication facets, that would be great. Danny, only with pleasure, and lovely to be back with you again. Uh, what you. I picked up immediately from Jim was the story about collaborative. If we don't collaborate, we're not going to get results. And this is for one of two reasons. People have perceptions in life. They, they pigeonhole who people are and what they expect from them. And the more we push our professions and the more we advertise our professions, the more people begin to 
have expectations that when they come in, this is what they're going to get. And unfortunately, that is what dentistry has done to itself over the last 40 or 50 years. Dentists are not regarded as doctors in the eye of the general public. They are regarded as very highly skilled, very competent technicians who do wonderful restorations and who do beautiful smiles and who do lovely teeth and uh, orthodontically balanced upper sixes and lower sixes. The, the whole concept of the dentist being a physician has gone out of the door and we have to try and bring that back if we want people to take what we're going to say to them seriously. So this slide that you can see, which says the only thing that interferes with my learning is my education, is probably so valid when it comes to dentistry. And right up in the beginning, Peter said it all. He said, you have to pass your exams and your exams are purely a technical clinical thing that you have to satisfy your examiners. They're not interested in your practice as a business. They want to know if they sign your certificate that you are a competent dentist. Well, there are two sides to this whole coin. And the, sign, the one side is the symptoms. People present with symptoms. Where do they get the symptoms from? Short of your virus, bacteria, parasite, fungus, those are the only four categories of communicable disease that you could catch. You do not catch high blood pressure. You do not catch a sore knee. You do not catch all of these things that have started to become chronic long-term diseases. These things we create. And in most cases, we create them as a defense mechanism in the body against what it is that we are doing. So it all boils down to behavior and it's physiological behavior, it's psychological behavior, it's cellular behavior, it's muscle patterning behavior. And as we behave in a particular way, so our physiology changes and the repetitive behavioral changes that we make cause our physiology to, to compensate and to create power functions to keep us doing what we're saying to the body, this is now normal for me. So we have to go right down to the nub of what is going on. And to make it really simple, the total focus of the human organism is to take the next breath. If you don't take the next breath, it doesn't matter what internet speed you have, where you parked your car, how much gas is in the tank. Consequently, starting from the moment of birth, if the infant is having trouble breathing, that infant will open its mouth or lift its chin or tilt its head or bend its shoulder or arch its back just to take the next breath. And we continue to do that the rest of our lives. So the symptoms that we have are largely a consequence of our behavior. So the professions that are dedicated to fixing the symptoms do wonderful work. The restoration work, the, the acute care, the rebuilding of joints and things of that nature are quite magnificent. But if we don't get down to why it happened and what we can do to stop that continuing to happen, relapse is undoubtedly going to happen and if you don't follow your patients and dentistry is one of the few professions that does follow its patients many many other disciplines fix the problem and they don't see the person again and they don't know that they have relapsed so the point I'm making here is this has to be collaborative this has to be on the one side of the coin looking after the symptoms attached to the person and on the other side is to look after the person attached to the symptoms and see why they have created those particular patterns which have caused them to have what they have. So we're now in a situation where dentistry is not about teeth. It does involve teeth, but the dentist gets to see people long before they become symptomatic if the patient is prepared to listen to the fact that the dentist knows what to look for. And I think that is our major challenge 
that we're facing here is patient education so that they don't look on their dentist as a tooth doctor. And we discussed this a little earlier. What dentists are actually offering is an integrative health care operation. But the patient has to learn that this is the fact and this is the case. And that is probably one of our major challenges. So it to wrap indeed. it up, you know, what I can say to you is I envisage a different model here. Very few dentists today do their own clean scale and polish. They have hygienists to do that. Dentists are not paid for education. Dentists are not paid for spending an hour and a half talking to patients, explaining about breathing and sleep and nutrition. It just doesn't fit the practice model. What we're looking at here is a specially trained therapist who is going to work side by side with the integrative dentist, the same way as the hygienist works with the, with the, um, the general dentist. And these therapists will take over that educative and, and managing role under the watchful eye of the dentist. And that is where we are. I'm very happy to tell you all that we now have a university which is delivering these courses as academic units, where previously they were all free for all individual people who were teaching courses over weekends and providing their own certification. We're on the way now to make this a very highly trained, very highly accredited um, university delivered protocol, which is built around the concept of behavioral modification as an adjunct to symptomatic treatment. And we can go into that a little further in detail later on if anybody wants to. Well, I'm sure we will. And uh, thank you very much, Roger. And you touch on so many key points. The, the, the group, when we met prior to, uh, to going live, we, we chatted a little bit about a lot of things. And, you know, one you mentioned is branding. And the fact is that uh, in America, especially, people don't think of Dennis as anything other than tooth fixers which is a shame and not really how it began. I, I shared that if you look in Wikipedia, one of the things that they describe in defining a dentist is that it is actually the world's oldest medical specialty. And I was reminded of this at a meeting I attended in uh, Phoenix a couple of months ago where I met a Colombian dentist. She's a pediatric dentist now practicing in Pennsylvania. She shared with me that you can't be a dentist in Colombia until you get a medical degree. You have to be an MD because they do indeed view it as a specialty. And I think it's, it's, it's unfortunate that organized dentistry has not led the charge in helping you know, do a public service campaign like we did about pollution and litter in the 1960s or against smoking to let people understand. Now the government isn't gonna do that and they shouldn't, but well actually they could because it would help with prevention and it would probably uh, lower the healthcare bill. Uh, of our country, but why groups like the ADA aren't actively and aggressively helping change the mindset and viewpoint is, is really, at, at best, it's unfortunate. But with that said, it's still, we have a lot of power as individuals, and, uh, and we also have a lot of power uh, that are strength in numbers. And with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Doug, Doug Thompson who is practicing this idea that, uh, you know, one small voice can make a difference, but a group of similar voices can, can move mountains. So with that, Doug, I'd like to ask you to say a few words. Thank you so much, Danny, for inviting me to be part of the panel tonight. I appreciate it. Um, I got my start in this interest in integrative uh, oral medicine studying periodontal disease and the intricacies of periodontal disease and the bacteria that cause these diseases and uh, this disease. And it was impossible to separate the mouth from the rest of the body. And then I started to study functional medicine. And in the functional medicine world, the functional medicine docs were very, very keen about anything that, that contributed to whole body inflammation. And so it really started the genesis of thinking about how to organize a real systematic exam process for the new patient and how to relate dental conditions, perio, cavities, um, environmental issues like erosion and abrasion, functional issues, oral cancer, obviously airway issues, which Roger's so passionate about, 
and even appearance related issues to how that contributes to other whole body issues uh, and how it generates a potential inflammatory process for the patient. So we started to put, get, to put together a functional, a very a structured uh, oral exam process that um, provided a walkout assessment for the patient. And in each one of those areas, we relate that condition to systemic health. And so at the end of the examination process, the patient has in writing a detailed, uh, a detailed journal, basically, of what's going on in their mouth. And so it's really been a great way to integrate and to begin to integrate the concept of uh, something in your mouth can be affecting the rest of your health. And I wanted to be networked with a community of like-minded dentists, and that was difficult to find. We had certain meetings like Roger uh, illuminated. We had weekend meetings and other things like that. Um, and then we need tools to educate and we need other things to help support our patients during the process. And so in most recent, uh, most recently we've created a network of people that are thinking that way and operating that way. And it's been really a lot of fun to, um, to work, uh, and help patients understand how their dental conditions can affect their, uh, their systemic health. So I'm, I would love to open the, uh, the meeting up to the folks that are listening in that have questions. Uh, we all have something unique to offer and um, I'm uh, ready, to, uh, ready to get into it. I couldn't be more excited about talking about this topic. That's great, Doug. Thanks very much. And uh, that's what we're going to do. There's no shortage of questions that I have that many others have got too. Um, they're already coming in. Uh, let's see what uh, would be a good one to start with. Well, you know what? This one is for Jim. Jim Highland. Uh, you touched on it briefly, but please, if you wouldn't mind elaborating, uh, what alternative is there to systemic antibiotics if antibiotics are indicated and recommended? And, you know, we people are becoming uh, more aware of the dangers that are inherent in terms of uh, resistance and uh, and also uh, the, the the deleterious effects on the healthy uh, the gut microbiome of using these 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 systemic antibiotics so what would you have to say about that and i know you're going to have to do with rinses so. um, okay well first of all uh, i think that we have to understand that periodontal disease is a serious medical condition that can be life threatening and life altering it isn't a little bleeding I think when you, if you have bleeding, your physician will be relentless in trying to find the cause of it, treat it, and then reassess. And that's the model that you need to use to treat bleeding. So when you consider that the, the, the medical effects in terms of cardiovascular, pregnancy, respiratory, um, and other effects it can have, we need to control the bleeding. To do that, you have to see how much is there. Once we recommend that you do a, a, a biofilm test, ours is called biofilm DNA, and we have gram stain test where you test individual sites and get a report on up to six sites. From there, you get a profile of the bacteria that are present and you can select antibiotics. When we select antibiotics in dentistry, we tend to use amoxicillin and then we tend to follow with chlorhexidine. Our challenge is that is the standard of care, but nobody asks why and is it effective? The challenge with amoxicillin is it's a broad spectrum antibiotic. Being broad spectrum, it's going to wipe out many bacteria throughout the mouth and periodontal pathogens. When you use gram, it does tackle the more gram positive bacteria as its focus than the gram negative anaerobes that cause periodontal disease, breath odor, and are responsible for the oral systemic link. So our standard of care is to use amoxicillin when we should be using something like metronidazole. We choose not to use metronidazole because of the anabuse effect and the concern that the patients will not persist with taking it if they can't take a drink. And it also uh, does have a taste and it can cause stomach upset. So we choose another medication to use that can be taken before, during, after meals easily, but we're not going to get the clinical outcome. We're diminishing our results because of it. Finally, we uh, recommend that you consider using uh, a, uh, something to tackle the yeast that's in the mouth. And so when we did our gram stain analysis and on our, our DNA test includes a test for yeast as well as strep mutans, so we get a whole mouth testing, um, you can then start to target the bacteria. And what you find is most patients have a subclinical yeast infection 
and yeast is being found to be responsible and necessary for early childhood decay. I believe the same thing for geriatric root decay. And in virtually every patient that has significant periodontal concerns in terms of the number of bleeding points being over 40 to 50, pockets five and six millimeters, you will find yeast is present. And if you deliver an antibiotic, you will get an overgrowth of yeast. So we started including nystatin in our rinses and uh, we found that it weakens the cell walls of all bacteria. So an antibiotic rinse then, as a rinse and spit, can be targeted to the bacteria that are found in the profile of your DNA or your gram stain test. And it can be a metronidazole nystatin, uh, metronidazole nystatin amoxicillin, it might be a tetracycline based if you're finding a lot more gram positive bacteria. And we do custom ones as well as required to treat people who have what are called pandas and, and diseases like that. So the challenge then is we're able to deliver it without swallowing. If you don't swallow, you do not affect the gut biotome. And the perception is that you're not delivering enough antibiotic or how can it get to the depth of the pocket? And the reason is that it's particulate as opposed to liquid. And being particulate in very fine slurry, it sticks to the biofilm, it gets down in through the sulcus up to six millimeters, and it gets the back of the tongue and the throat. And you get a slow release as this continues to dissolve and you get 100% in the mouth 3,000 times the concentration of what you get with oral dosing, and the effect is you wipe this infection out if it's targeted to what you're doing. And so our studies were done uh, using antibiotic rinses and oral hygiene, and there was no scaling done on our study of 649 patients where we uh, had the results I intimated with an 87% reduction in bleeding and a shrinkage of about 80% in pockets in two weeks. So antibiotic rinses work and they provide mm -hmm. an alternative, but there are times when you need to use um, oral antibiotics as well. And uh, cases of that would be someone who has severe periodontal disease, who has a significant medical history where uh, you have to absolutely prevent bacteremias, and you can be creative with antibiotic rinses and have them using them during therapy if you perceive risk. But there are times where you would use oral antibiotics, but it might be about 10% of the time as opposed to 90% of the time. Right. And finally, we have it in a cream form that can be applied locally to individual areas as opposed to rinsing the whole mouth with it. And is it also the case that with your uh, your your testing that you can identify which bacteria is present in high risk prep, you know pathogens that are are present and therefore be a little bit more precise in your prescription even if you do have to uh, administer an oral antibiotic that's correct and that's the that's the that's the focus behind oral dna and hain uh, both of them will recommend oral antibiotics um, and basically if you have aa you need to consider using something like amoxicillin if the person's not allergic. There are alternatives to it that we can offer as well if they are allergic to amoxicillin. But for most other gram-negative anaerobes, you're going to use metronidazole as your base. Mm -hmm. One other thing I learned from you among many things, uh, but this is what sticks in my mind most recently, is that it's not sufficient to just, uh, if you're gonna do salivary testing, to just ask someone to to give you a sample of saliva. It's site-specific, right? Well, there, there are three ways that you can sample. Um, there's a salivary sample itself, and again I, again, I have a conflict of interest talking about this, but I'm trying to talk as a wet-fingered clinical dentist and trying to give some perspective. The saliva testing can be variable, depending on what the patient does before they come in. Did they have a drink, alcoholic drink? Did they cleanse their mouth thoroughly? Did they use mouthwash for two minutes before they saw you? And this will alter the free-floating bacteria for the most part, which a saliva test will uh, right. give you. And the saliva test tends to be an indirect measurement of subgingival biofilm. Second, mm -hmm. Hain has a wonderful method with, with using paper points. Paper points will give you a direct testing in specific sites. Usually you're going to collect about five sites from, from around the mouth, so it's a pooled sampling. Uh, that's a very direct subgingival sampling. But our studies show when we were doing gram stain, where we were testing the back of the tongue and the throat, these areas didn't change with oral antibiotics. Uh, six weeks of oral antibiotics with patients with severe breath odor, it didn't change these biofilms. But the very first person we put on an antibiotic mouthwash, it cleared those samples. So you need to then test for the back of the tongue and throat. We do that by using um, 
uh, a saliva sample and by wiping a small pad at the back of the tongue and throat, we collect some from the saliva. We use a pad, to, we use a paper point to go under the gum and then we wipe the pad against the lingual surface of the teeth to pick up the su supra gingival. So we get supra, sub, saliva and whole mouth biofilm for really a complete biofilm picture. Got it. Okay. Would anybody else on the panel like to uh, elaborate yeah, on this? this? This is Peter. Jim, I've got a question uh, because I've got my master's degree in immunology and uh, microbiology from the Medical College of Virginia, and I was uh, four months short of my PhD research before I went to dental school. So I, I've got an appreciation for the amount of research uh, that you're getting done on this. And m my question is this. Have you, have you tried anything uh, that has more natural um, – ingredients, uh, something like from the dental herb company that has pharmaceutical grade plant extracts and essential oils, things like that, uh, instead of uh, Paradex. Uh, anything on the more natural end of it besides uh, the, the prescription uh, medications that you're studying? Uh, it's a it's a good question and I would say in the beginnings we did our original focus was on breath care and so we used to do gram stains when we did that we would take the mirror and put it at the back of the tongue put it on a slide put the mirror on the front of the tongue put it on the slide and take floss or picks and go between the teeth uh, one quadrant at a time and so we'd have six samples to look at when we gave when the patients were these are patients now breath odor patients who are rinsing with everything under the sun when they come in to see us. And uh, they were not controlling these, these biofilms that were pathogenic. And the reason is that they can't penetrate those biofilms. Mm -hmm. So the difference now, it has a use. And the place is, once you control those biofilms, you need to use a product to help maintain health. And that's where I think these products come into place more. In other words, they're the supplement and the maintenance for the patient to help keep them healthy along with excellent dental care, exceptional home care, and then some chemical management. Got it. Good point. Got it. Anybody else on this topic? No, I just Not I, I agree that I agree that the natural herbals and the natural stuff, uh, those are great maintenance products, but not as effective for treatment. Doug, how about talking about you use bleach? Now, bleach is a, is a, is a, is a good therapy as well. Do, do you want to mention some of the products you use? No, I just, I, I just think the, you know, we're trying to, when we have an active periodontal disease, we're treating a dysbiosis. And we use antibiotics and we use harsh uh, adjusters when we have disease. When we have uh, when we have stabilized disease, we surely don't need those types of things. Correct. So, uh, Jim, you alluded to it, and uh, Peter, you're you, you know you were talking about it a little bit, but um, you know you use medicines and you use things to create uh, restabilization when you have a dysbiosis, and then you uh, then you you know I prefer the patient to have nothing if they have good balanced biofilm, but when they have disease, we have to attack it with uh, with things that are going to get the job done. Could you bring probiotics in here? Because that's a component of, of a natural product to use. Yeah, two schools of thought on probiotics. Uh, I've tested several things where you chew something and it's supposed to replace the healthy bacteria in the mouth, around the sulcus, on the teeth. Uh, the tests that I've done haven't, haven't shown to be that that's been so productive uh, in, in eliminating bleeding and controlling the disease. Uh, the probiotic that I've spent the most time working with is probiotics that uh, that reestablish a healthy gut biofilm from antibiotic-associated diarrhea or gut disturbance from the use of systemic antibiotics. Jim, you know I've been studying oral pathogens and uh, biofilm shifting for nine years, and I was never, I've never, I've never been successful, uh, and I've never gotten cleaner retests than using systemic antibiotics. So in the future, as your company has a lot of hope with oral rinse antibiotics, it'll be great to see what the tests bear out over time and what kind of retests we get, um, because that will be that will be exciting to take systemics off the table for except for certain cases. So probiotics that I've used uh, help reestablish healthy gut biofilm, and um, and we have some particular uh, you know there's a particular ingredient. I think it's I think it's much too detailed for uh, for tonight, but there's a there's a, a nice uh, competitive um, yeast for Candida called Saccharomyces boulardii, and your probiotics should have that in. And there's several companies that make uh, make products that have Saccharomyces boulardii for gut dysbiosis. 
Very interesting. I, I'm reading uh, David Perlmutter's second book, uh, Brain Maker. I read Grain Brain, and he's very big on the um, fermented foods and uh, pickled foods that seem to do that, and you, they're actually palatable. So uh, I, I happen to believe that that's, that's a really important element to staying healthy, and I try to avoid antibiotics, except, as you said, when you got to when you got to zap those bugs fast and hard, uh, that's probably the way to go. Uh, here's another question we just got, which is, uh, we know that sugar topically, sugar topically feeds biofilm. What is your, I would say, what is the panel's position on the systemic impact of sugar on inflammation and gingival bleeding? Who wants to start? If I mean, I'm happy to. I, I'm happy to to only exactly. say that uh, with you know, without having a lot of research, there's a colorectal surgeon that wrote a book called Stop Only Sugar, and sugar is the uh, you know c contributes to so much disease, and there's nothing you know biofilm biofilms love uh, blood that has uh, non-regulated sugar. And so when you have high amounts of sugar in the blood, you eat high, high sugar diets, even high animal protein diets, uh, you're going to see more gingival bleeding. And there's a couple of nice papers in Periodontology 2000 about uh, nutrigenomics and nutrition in periodontal disease management. And so high, pro high animal protein foods and high sugar diets are definitely going to create a more inflammatory environment, not only for the teeth, but just for the, uh, for the body in general. The first biofilm that settles in the mouth, the initiators, is uh, tends to be sugar-based as well. So it helps to initiate the formation of the pathogenic um, change that occurs. Um, it's also are empty calories, and the patient is not as healthy. If they're not as healthy, their immune system's not going to be as, as well. They're going to gain weight. If they gain weight, it produces inflammation. So it, it, it's something that is one of the central feeding mechanisms for creating overall body inflammation. And then the periodontal infection is something that uh, there's no fever, there's no pain, there's no swelling, there's no sign you have the problem until you measure it directly with either bleeding on probing, DNA, DNA testing of some sort, or do a papillary bleeding score uh, or a scaling score is the same thing really, um, yeah, unless you do that. Which is another way to make the problem tangible for the patient, because otherwise, as I often say, you know, if we, we stick our finger in a socket and we get shocked. We don't do that again. Yes. But when you engage in these uh, chronic activities, these destructive activities, really, uh, it's like cranking a generator that's building a charge that will zap you uh, eventually. It just may not do it uh, today. So, again, it's about uh, making it tangible, making it real for the patient which is all about communication. And speaking of that, we have a question which begins with a comment. I, I believe that communications are critical too. Uh, where do you have these types of conversations with your new patient? In the consult room, in the treatment room, someplace else? Well, if I can jump in here, the last place you want to have this conversation is in the dental chair. <laughs> because their expectation in the dental chair from experience is pain, discomfort, not knowing what's going to come next, people hovering over them. This is all sub, very, very much subconscious. All of these discussions, I believe, should be in a neutral environment where they're seeing you not as a dentist with a loop and a headlamp. They're seeing you as an advisor and as a specialist and as a professional who has knowledge beyond the dental chair and the drill. I think that's an excellent insight. And because the environment, and when I coach on telephone skills, before I even talk about, the, you know, the communications, I ask people, what, what characterizes your environment? Is it, is it chaotic or is it supportive and serene? And here's a quintessential example. People associate discomfort in the chair. And there's also a whole, a whole study of just uh, body language and positioning. I mean, if you're looking down at the patient, they, they feel uncomfortable and, and 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 not open to uh, to what you have to say. So I, I think that's a great point. Uh, who else would like to comment on this question as to where and how to perhaps structure that new patient conversation? Well, I can I can 
let me let me just uh, give my opinion on on um, something that that you, you just don't want to be looking down on someone uh, trying to trying to uh, give them an education um, about when they're staring up at the ceiling. So it's got to be more of a sitting in the chair in a consulting room, just like Roger said, with eye to eye, knee to knee. Um, but um, for the communication part of it, um, I I was just looking just looking at, at all of the things that we're talking about tonight and it's a lot of clinical protocols and um, procedures and I'd like just to give three questions that I normally ask a patient that kind of generates uh, the initial trust factor uh, so you can uh, suggest and propose your best care so when you want to get when you want to get your best care out of there, like for periodontal disease or restorative uh, care with with biocompatible materials and cosmetics and TMD and, and sleep apnea and pathology and infections and occlusal disease, all of those seven diagnostic disciplines that we use to treatment plan, we trying to get that, trying to get the patient to accept that. Let me just give you um, three questions that I normally ask patients, and we do this. You know, the first thing I pick up is a pencil, uh, not my uh, mirror and explorer. Those stay on the bracket tables. And one of the first questions I'll ask is, um, have you had any bad experiences at the dentist? And this is a series of three questions that will uh, make sense in just a second. But uh, what that allows you is it allows you to show some compassion to be on the patient's side. Uh, maybe they have had bad experiences with, with third molars or uh, someone who didn't use anesthetic or something like that. But then immediately, so ask that question, have you ever had any bad experiences at the dentist? After they vent <laughs> with, with their bad experiences, or maybe they didn't have any, I want you to ask a second question um, very spontaneously. I want you to ask, um, so what makes a good dentist, you know, in your eyes when you're looking at the, when you're looking at the patient? Uh, and they're going to tell you. And they say, well, nobody's ever asked me that before. But they'll say somebody who's knowledgeable, somebody who's, you know, gentle, somebody who's uh, thorough and honest. And what that patient is telling you right then, and this goes to the communications of eye to eye and knee to knee without looking down at the patient. The patient's telling you what they want from you. They want you to be honest, thorough, uh, caring, gentle. And so a verbal script that you could ask and, and, and go with right then is that says, well, you know, listen, you know, Mrs. Jones, uh, if it's all right to you, uh, I will be as thorough and as gentle as possible. And uh, I will um, uh, have all those things you just mentioned, we will do for you. Will that be okay? And then the patient agrees. You have the permission to be thorough, caring, uh, painless, all those kind of things. And then, the, so that generates uh, the feeling of some trust right away because the patient knows they're going to get those out of you. And that's what they want because you've got to be able to, to talk to that patient in the language of the patient about those things that matter to that patient. And then I got one more question. I ask patients, how long are you going to live? And that takes them by surprise every time because um, nobody asks them that question. But if they're going to live till they're 90 years old or 92 years old, the next question after that is, are you going to have your teeth? Now, and the purpose of that is this, if they're going to have their teeth when they're 90 years old, then they need a plan. And if they say, yes, I plan to keep my teeth when I'm 90 years old, but then you have the perfect opportunity to say, then yes, let's look at sleep and breathing. Let's look at TMD. Let's look at infections. Let's look at sleep apnea. Let's look at perio. If we've got to use any one of those seven diagnostic disciplines or all of them to get you to 90 years old with the least amount of problems, uh, now you've got the permission to include all of those disciplines in your diagnosis and treatment plan, and you've got a better chance at having the patient trust you and accept those recommendations. So um, those three questions, or there's probably more, I just said probably four or five there, but those three questions um, on the communication side of things, eye to eye and knee to knee, outside of the, outside of the treatment room are a, a very simple way to broach the communications with the patient and get permission to use your best diagnostics um, for their overall health because the seven diagnostics are going to include everything about whole body health. But this is also the trap. Indeed. And the trap is that you... Open Hold on, the just, Roger, 
I just yes. want to ask everybody, because I know who you are, and we're having a nice conversation, but Virginia uh, reminded yeah. me that, that our attendees don't know who's speaking. So that was Peter Evans. Uh, Roger spoke prior to Peter, and uh, if, if going forward, if you would just remind people who you are, um, then at least they, they can put a, a name with the voice. Okay, this is Roger, the name of the voice. Um, the trap there is that it tends to lead you way, way beyond your appointment time. It tends to lead you to a position where the patient is not ready to listen to this. They might not have time. They don't want to be rude. They might be turning off or tuning out halfway through. And that is where the support team comes in, where you maintain your position as the physician, as the lead, the lead practitioner. And you say, well, our practice has now evolved. And we have specialists in various divisions who've been trained specifically to look at this area, to look at that area, to look at the sleep, to look at the nutrition. And our, our belief here is that none of us are smart enough to know everything ourselves. Would you agree with that? So that opens the door for you to say to them, this is an integrative practice. I'm going to be the conductor of the orchestra but I do have specialist musicians in a number of fields. And that is the area that I've been focusing on for the last 20 years. And it's now starting to come to fruition. Well, maybe most of the, most of the dentists that are on with us tonight, um, maybe, they, maybe they don't have practices that they are leaning towards uh, hiring uh, extra staff members to take over those ancillary positions. So my thought is, is that for the general practitioner who has, you know, one hygienist, one or two clinical uh, assistants and somebody up front, one or two people up front, what can they do right now, right now for the next new patient Monday morning to ask those questions and say, you know, essentially says, you know, how do you want to be treated in my office? And, and then use your diagnostic abilities to get a treatment plan and uh, have the patient accept it, mainly because the patient is agreeing to uh, keep their teeth for a lifetime and knowing that you are more of a whole body dentist or an integrative dentist. Um, it, it comes down to um, a, a simple point is that it's got to be doable for the regular average dentist to say, I can ask those questions, I can do that, but I don't have the wherewithal to uh, hire two more ancillary people in, in specific therapy uh, positions in my office. So um, when we talk to people, we've got to be able to uh, give them something simple that they can develop some instant trust with, with their patients, and have them accept, those, uh, accept their best care. Um, so the model of integrative dentistry can go from uh, a simple um, practice like mine, one dentist, one hygienist, clinical and front desk, all the way to Roger, the, your model of uh, the integrative uh, dental office too. Um, and it's good to present both, both, both models, I think. So um, I don't know if Jim or Doug has got any other model oh. inside in their practice that um, kind of fits in between those. Um, well, happily to, to expand on that, that is what we're working on now. We're getting to a situation where the dentist can identify issues, and we have two networks of trained people to whom your patients can be referred if you don't have the facility to do it yourself. And those two areas are orofacial myofunctional teaching and posture and breathing and breathing behavior evaluation. So you can actually talk to the patient professionally, identify issues, and say, here is a web address. You go on here, you will be matched with an online therapist who is going to look after these specific areas. And then you monitor how much of that you're sending out. And if you get to the break point where you find that you're sending out that many, that it would pay you to expand and take the office next door and get one new person, that is the model that we have, starting really small and going through the various levels until it's an all singing, all dancing practice with everybody involved. That's a very helpful model to share, too, because then people don't feel like they have to take that huge step off, step off the cliff. Exactly. And, and basically what I'm hearing, too, which is really 
interesting. And I know I have clients that are looking at bringing in nurse practitioners because as Roger pointed out, you don't get paid for advice, but, but you ought to. And one way to do that is to have somebody who can uh, bill for, for, for their time and you can lease space to them if you want. And what this really does is introduce a fourth C. And so we've got clinical collaborative communication. It occurs to me just as I was preparing for this talk that a fourth C might be cash flow. Uh, we, we need to find a way to monetize this model, obviously, so that we can all be successful and help that many more people. And I think I want to invite everyone to share these models uh, and elaborate on them further if they'd like. Uh, and before I ask another question, does anybody want to do that who hasn't already yeah. spoken? I, yeah. I'd like to talk about the concept you discussed, Jim? which is the nurse practitioner. I um, mm -hmm. attended my first uh, Bail Deneen um, preceptorship uh, last year, uh, pardon me, this spring, and they talked about this concept, and I think it's a matter of having a vision collaboratively of how you want to practice and who around you you can network with, whether it's in your practice or outside, that you can refer people to obtain good care. Bail Deneen, if, if people aren't familiar, were the first people to write in the British Medical Journal in November last year, a causative relationship between periodontal pathogens and, and uh, cardiovascular disease. As a little background, um, Doug, I think you're a patient of theirs. Uh, I hope I'm not revealing private matters there, but they... <laughs> Yeah, they, yeah, uh, they uh, guarantee their patients. They guarantee their patients <laughs> yeah. no heart attack or stroke. Right. Or they will and give I, and I think they've had one. Yeah, they've they've had one case in all the years that they've been offering this to thousands of patients. That's correct. So when you can talk to your patients about heart disease, and you can talk to uh, the basis that um, their studies, although they didn't publish it, show up to a fifty percent causal relationship, and this is groundbreaking research that every dentist and hygienist should be aware of. It, this is the collaborative effort you have to have in communicating with the patient, relating their clinical condition to their medical and overall health, their family health, and to their dental health. So um, this collaborative business is very important. And as you start to practice this way in a medical model, you need to have support that you can send people to for care, or you have it in-house because you can't do it all yourself. And if I may add something here, there are many cases where doctors are accusing dentists of practicing medicine without a license because doctors believe that they own the world of sleep. Well, the irony is that the majority of sleep disorders are rather breathing disorders which manifest themselves during sleep. And dentists do not make sleep appliances. Dentists make breathing appliances. So if we just turn it slightly, that the dentist becomes focused on breathing, you then stay out of the ambit of the doctors who are claiming that you're practicing medicine without a license. So if you look to your would-be therapists and the ones that we're training, we're looking to train physical therapists, occupational therapists, chiropractors, people who are licensed to bill, not the 7007 ones, but they're licensed to bill. <laughs> the bill. <laughs> and Very the good. beauty of that is that it monetizes the operation without impacting or impinging on your time. And if you introduce your patient and you say, I'd like you to meet Susie. Susie is a registered physical therapist. She's been in practice for 20 years. She has additional training and experience in jaw, in posture, in breathing, in diaphragmatic movement in the muscles of the face of the mouth and the neck. You've already established her credibility in your life and you can actually work with her side by side or she can have a separate practice within your office. The sad thing about the United States is that 42 states prevent dentists from doing or charging for anything outside of the oral cavity. This is what makes the orofacial myology so difficult. This is what makes all the other things which are related to sleep and breathing and posture and physical therapy so difficult for dentists to bill for and to charge because you're operating beyond the scope of your license. So the, issue, the own, mm -hmm. uh, This is Jim. An issue that needs to be brought up beyond the scope of practice is that when we start measuring blood pressure, 
if you start recommending to test and see what their blood sugars are like, even with a little diabetic strip, if you measure, do blood tests to measure inflammatory markers, you now assume a responsibility to ensure that treatment is provided to the condition that you find. And if, unless you're vastly experienced, you need to be careful about venturing into that area. And so talking about it and suggesting they go somewhere for these types of tests is more appropriate than doing it yourself. So having experts that you can refer to in-house or out is perhaps the way to manage the situation so we're not looking over our shoulders for ambulance chasers. 100% right. so, absolutely yeah. so. Jim. And not only does that uh, deal, I, I sounds like it would satisfactorily address any liability concerns that one might have, but it really does open up a vast opportunity for collaboration. I have to share that, you know, in most of the uh, events that I've hosted and people that I spoke with, we've heard certainly a good amount about collaboration, but that seems to be the C in this panoply of three C's or four now, if you include cash flow, that, that seems to get the least, the least airtime. And I'm really excited and encouraged because we seem to be really talking in pretty tangible terms about the wonderful opportunities we have to help our patients and at the same time grow this collaborative network and uh, along those lines I'd like to ask a question that was just submitted which uh, reads I heard some discussion of the recurring public perception that dentists are more technical in nature and not so much doctors I'm a doctor in prevention I'd like to see more teamwork between docs and dentists could I hear more about uh, the vision in this area? What are the key next steps in terms of training docs for this treatment? How about the next steps in training the dentist? How do we get our patients comfortable with these team approaches? So the patient's perspective as well is very important to consider. It, when you um, provide care to somebody or if I've done an examination, a new patient examination, I'll walk the patient into the hygiene and I'll discuss what we just did, what we just found, and I'll say, and I'm not looking at the patient almost, I'm looking at the clinician, and then I'll look at the patient having repeated everything and said, you're in good hands with this person, they can take care of you. So whether you use that model to, I need you to, I recommend that you see your physician with your health history, with what I'm finding with uh, a lot of bleeding and you have a history of high blood pressure, uh, you need to make sure that you're being checked regularly, that your medications are done. Um, you, uh, I'm seeing issues in terms of inflammatory diseases and there's a history of rheumatoid arthritis, I need to communicate with your rheumatologist because I believe it's impacting. I had a, the, the, the pregnancy issue. These are all these types of issues where you need to then be able to present to a physician and talk to a physician. A physician wants facts. They want a perio chart. They want a DNA test. They want clinical information, not it looks good, I like, and it seems. And we don't live in that world in dentistry. Uh, unfortunately, we need to be more there. And one thing, this is Doug. Uh, one thing I would say is that, you know, during the new patient exam, you're making an assessment. Um, where you don't necessarily have to come up with an entire treatment plan during the new patient examination. And if you have patients that have disease entities, caries, or uh, cavities, you can talk to them about either doing restorative care or you could talk to them about how that disease process uh, involves uh, their medical health uh, to gain the patient's uh, trust. Those patients then, are at that time, you have the option of how you want to direct that conversation. And I agree with things that have been said about communication is that get those discussions out of the exam room into a different room uh, with anybody. It could, it, and if you create simple uh, very simple patient and team awareness tools that they can use to help educate the patient. It will greatly simplify uh, that process. The other thing you, you mentioned recently about medical testing. You know, you can have lipid screening at the Chicago uh, midwinter dental meeting. So we yep. can start doing lots of things in our practice that are very easy as screening tools without running the risk of, of having to treat the patient for that. And so this is a great way to have a collaborative opportunity with your physician. If you discover something that's, uh, that's uh, grossly out of whack or that's out of whack with the patient, you can refer to a physician. And how I started to get the eyes of physicians in my community was to share with them 
and call them and talk to them about treating the patients for periodontal disease when I was going to use an antibiotic or when I was going to use, you know, it, it was a revolve, revolved around using an antibiotic. When you send a physician uh, an oral DNA or a biofilm DNA test, can you share with them what your approach is for how you're going to tackle that disease? I can guarantee you the next patient they have that has periodontal disease, they'll send to you. And those relationships will build one, you know, one person at a time. It'll be the same thing in airway management. When we see a patient that has a problem with airway, we refer them out to a myofunctional therapist or to uh, somebody else, an ENT, for evaluation. And the, EN, you know, the first thing you have to do is see if someone can breathe through their nose. And Roger can, uh, can attest to that. So these little tiny hints that we get in the assessment, we can use physicians to, um, to, uh, to start to, to, to make these small, easy referrals and um, and it'll 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 pretty soon the pa the physicians will know uh, they have a patient with medical issues they're going to send them to you and that's how that's happened with me over the years and it's been a great resource I do sleep screening I do home sleep studies on probably three or four patients a week that come from a cardiologist and um, and wellness exams and elevated HSCRP pa patients come in it evolves over time so those are a couple ideas about how to collaborate with some physicians great ideas. Uh, but anyone else? Yeah, sure. this is Peter. Uh, I want to come in on that fourth C you talked about, cash flow. Uh, mm -hmm. I think for all the people listening uh, right now, uh, that um, a regular a regular dental office trying to see 20, 30, 40 new patients a, a month, run them in, run them out, uh, going to be real hard to, uh, to, to diagnose everything that you want to into an integrative practice. But if you do take the opportunity to uh, study maybe more whole body dentistry and integrated practice. Every model that we have amongst all of the panelists, all of these models are working to some degree of success. Um, and and if, if, the, if the listeners right now, if it's not profitable, they're not going to do it. So I can, I can guarantee you that what the average uh, average new, new patient value national average new patient value is somewhere around seventeen hundred dollars seventeen fifty per patient uh, and I can tell you uh, I don't know but I would bet with Doug and Jim and Roger that they crush they crush the new average patient value with the treatment and the therapies and who benefits first of all uh, the business benefits uh, the patient absolutely benefits. The staff is on fire sometimes about, oh, oh my gosh, you know, we're doing something more than just uh, doing a DO on number 13 today. You know, we're doing making something. a difference. Oh, it's right. making a huge difference. But I can guarantee you that uh, it's a profitable business model. And, you know, Roger, Jim, Doug, if you could just say yes, 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 if that's true for you guys, <laughs> these guys listening ought to know that, that this is this is where we're going in dentistry, and it's profitable and it's beneficial for all concerned. Uh, there's one additional you, benefit, this is Roger, that when you're looking at the person attached to the teeth, there are things that your team can do quite legally, and when we train them and equip them, and they become a greater part of what it is that you're doing, it elevates their status within the practice. They stay with you longer, they become more involved with your patients. And we watch these team meetings afterwards where people who used to be just dental assistants or, or front office staff become an integral part of this entire patient's life. It makes a huge difference to the ethos and the, the feeling within the practice. I'm so glad you mentioned it, Roger. That's exactly what I was going to point out is that you can have a two and a half million dollar practice with a bunch of miserable folks that really are only there because they have golden handcuffs. Or you can be working toward a purpose that is that is higher than any individual and 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 have people look forward to coming into work and feeling a sense of gratification. And when you consider the large percentage of our lives that we spend at work, I don't know about you, but I'd actually rather make less money and know that I'm making a big difference. Ideally, of course, you can have them both. If you, you just can have follow both. the protocol, yes. you can have both. Oh, One of the things collaboratively with your patient to talk about is to set a different vision of how you're going to take care of them different than the last dentist did. So if I see a patient come in with multiple amalgam restorations and just saw one just today, um, several teeth fractured, lots of root canals and crowns, 
and I sit down and talk, as, as so many have mentioned, I'd like to treat the cause of the problem because if I address the cause, I don't need to keep fixing your mouth up because I tell them they're going to run out of money or teeth and uh, they won't be happy when they run out of teeth. Uh, but I tell them there's a legacy of things that need to be fixed up at whatever rate they want to do it, but they want to do it so that it's a long-term solution and then I can get them and keep them healthy and I can virtually guarantee them that they won't have the costs that they've continued to have if they follow a program that takes a look at taking care of their whole mouth properly. There isn't a patient that doesn't respond to that and especially those that are tight on money because they don't want to keep wasting it. So uh, that's the type of focus you need to present to the patient. Talk about I'm going to fix up the legacy problems you have. I'm going to stop the disease so new things don't happen and then I'll be able to help and keep you maintained and you can save your money and save your teeth. That appeals to them a lot, but you better be able to do it. Yep. Put your money where their yeah, mouth is. A, yeah, this is, this is Doug. There's, there's no question, Jim, that's absolutely true. And one of the tips that I would uh, just give to some of the hygienists and uh, assistants and people that might not be uh, might want to learn and go down this road but not be so well versed is start to use your well patients uh, to discuss with them what they're avoiding in other words if you have a patient that comes in and they have beautiful gum health that's a nice the patient to have a very quick say two quick things or three quick words to them about how today we're worried about oral bacteria and the effect on oral systemic health and I'm, and I'm so thankful you don't have to worry about that today and if you just take you know 10 seconds and say something like that to somebody it really sets them up to let them know what you're thinking about what you might be looking for next time they might have a brother or a family member who's having problems with something like that it's really a nice way to uh to start to create a culture in your practice that you're looking at other things than just the teeth and then the last thing that i would say is uh to um Jim's point, give everybody the right to say no with dignity. Help them guide, help guide them to better health, but let them have the right to say no with dignity if it doesn't fit for them, and you'll build great trust, and your patients will, they'll, they'll come in and they'll ask you, what's the next thing I can do to be healthier? What's, can, what can you help me with? It's been it's really wonderful. rewarding. Yeah, yeah that's yeah, a wonderful is, phrase. Yeah, this is Peter. I could, I can, I can, I can tell you that from a marketing point of view, it, it just perfectly uh, said just a minute ago is that take your healthy patients, and once they explain what they're trying to avoid, you can just ask them. You know, would you go on Google and give us a five star, you know, uh, reference? Because in the marketing of this. Um, you've got your referral sources that you can go after with integrated physicians, functional physicians, nurses, um, oncologists we work with, uh, acupuncturists, um, naturopaths. There's, there's a wealth of people that you can go to as a referral source of, uh, uh, that, that look at more uh, whole body health. But to market it on your website, taking your healthy patients and asking them, yeah, could you, could you, could you talk about us on, on uh, Google or, or uh, health grades or Yelp or something like that. It's a perfect way to market this too, to help grow the practice. It also happens to be no cost, no cost. which is an excellent <laughs> thing. Now, uh, since yeah, you're on the subject believe, of reviews, I'm sorry. Who? And Danny, I was just going to say, so I, so to Jim's point, I, I, I really believe this should be doctor led but it, this, this whole wellness piece can be team executed. You can start to have your team mentioning what you're concerned about. You could have small little in-service staff meetings and start giving them some talking points and just let them start sharing what they're concerned about. Uh, and, you know, we have two beautiful bacterially mediated diseases that are host uh, driven. That's periodontal disease and cavities. And we treat that stuff all day long. And so just start, just start finding a couple little medical correlations and start there. When I talk to patients, just Doug, it's Jim, I tell patients that I only treat two conditions day in and day out. Aside from I need my wisdom teeth out, I need my teeth straightened or whitened, however I do it, I treat stress on teeth and I treat infections. And I tell them there's three stresses, grinding their teeth, brushing too hard, using too much toothpaste, and I'd buy, I, I mention a little bit more about that, and I say, now I'd like to get to the infections, because that's what causes most of the damage for you. I said, it's caused by bacteria. If I can get you to control the bacteria that cause gum disease, you will not have disease. If I get you to control the bacteria that cause decay, you will not have cavities. If I get you to control the bacteria that cause gum disease, I can control breath odor. And if you, con if you control the bacteria that cause gum disease, you will control the oral systemic link. 
And I'll ask them, do you see where the emphasis and care is? Either you're going to use me as a mechanic to fix things up because you choose not to, or you're going to have me help you heal you so you don't have to keep doing and repeating these things again. That's the type of conversation you have to have with your patient. Right. And that requires a, a little shift because they, they have really viewed dental offices as repair shops. Exactly. Yeah. But also, this All is right. Peter, uh, uh, it, when, when you have to take the time, when you have to take a little bit more time, and, and uh, Roger, you, you, you spoke to this uh, a, a little while ago about that some dentists don't have the time to go into these kinds of conversations, but when, you're, uh, you, when your, your, your average uh, new patient value is double or triple what the national average is, uh, you can buy it. yourself another 10 minutes. <laughs> it's worth it. It's time well spent. It reminds me when I talk about telephone skills coaching. If it takes you 12 minutes to get a new patient in the door, now first of all, with practice, you can probably do the same thing in the future in seven minutes, but some coaches say, get off the phone, don't waste valuable time. Well, if you're looking at average patient value of $1,700, which I believe is low too, if you offer complete care uh, and integrative care, it's on the low side, that you're being, you're being minute wise and dollar foolish for sure. And I think it's the same thing with the exam. It's the same thing if you want to consider making an offer. Sometimes dentists will say, well, you know, I'll offer a free exam, but it's going to be a really short one because they're not paying for it. Well, that's self-fulfilling. You know, if you want to underwhelm the new patient, then do that. But that's going to yield the, the, the unintended result, which is uh, a lack of retention. Uh, and the only other thing I wanted to mention before I forgot, since you, you brought up the idea of reviews, Peter, don't limit a request for five-star reviews to your patients. What, what better way to let the world know, prospective patients know, that you practice a collaborative mindset than to have your collaboration network speaking about you as well and offering it to do it for them. If you can honestly give good reviews of one of your fellow health practitioners and vice versa, I would encourage you to do that as well. Yeah. And Danny, I didn't I didn't mean to say that seventeen hundred and fifty dollars was was a, an integrative uh, practices. I know. Uh, n n n yeah, that. Uh, my, that's low. Yeah, that's that's national average of people that take insurances and and and, and struggle with trying to get uh, you know twenty more new patients in this week so they can reproduce the same you know machine they've got going all over the place. Um, I'm sure our new patient average value. Uh, absolutely crushes $1,700. Uh, That's right. And you're not even talking about lifetime patient value, which is, in my opinion, the valid measure. Yeah. Because these are future, if, I mean, these are individuals, and I don't want to sound crass or commercial, but from a business standpoint, when you generate a new patient, if that patient is communicated with properly, that patient represents an annuity. They represent a series of future cash flows through recare and referral. And the lifetime value, we did a, a colleague of mine did a study in, in the late 90s, which came up with the average patient lifetime value of about $4,800. So you can imagine that that is uh, considerably uh, higher with a practice that, that, that embraces this integrative practice model. And that's uh, also not, that's not discounting the fact that if your patient is happy, that patient is going to refer family and friends and the, the multiplier effect comes in. Yes, sir. That's right. It's, uh, it's multiple future cash flows. Next question. Uh, what communication do you have with your patient's physician after you discover oral disease? And what responses do you get from physicians? And I guess we would like to hear the good, the bad, and the ugly. This is Doug. Probably good, um, yeah. yeah, I you know, I have only had okay. physicians be very be very gracious in uh in discussion about oral disease, but how again, uh, I think one of the great ways to uh to talk with them about it is to is to ask them for help in treating that patient. So you have to have some you know, some reason why you're reaching out to them or why you're calling them. And again, the periodontal disease issue and looking at the biofilm and knowing that I had to shift biofilm to make that patient, uh, you know, be healthy, uh, to, to show them that that's what we were doing and, and that we needed, we wanted their uh, assurance and their collaboration on the use of antibiotics. It was very, it's been very productive. 
And then many uh, physicians, uh, general physicians, they might not know that you do home sleep studies. Um, they might not know that you offer some services to their patients that they might not want to even deal with. They're so stressed for time right now. We have to be so respectful of the physician's time and how burdened they are that there's, there's things we can lift off them to make their patients healthy. Um, that's great. You should let every cardiologist in your area know that you, you know, that, that you would be able to help evaluate sleep patients if they have AFib or if they have other, uh, other issues. So physicians are very gracious and accepting of our, mm -hmm. of our conversation, but they don't want their time wasted. I've never once right. went to a physician's office and told them what I could do for them. Uh, I've always called physicians and asked them for help on patients of record, mutual patients, and uh, I think that's a much better approach. I've reached out to physicians um, to do with breath care because I, I I treat breath care a lot, and I've had I get regular referrals from physicians for doing that, and it's an area of practice where literally you can charge between twelve to fifteen hundred dollars, and um, it's three hours time with the hygienist and a few. Uh, biofilm tests and antibiotic rinses. So there are areas you can get into and in communicating with the physician that are in your area of expertise if you have some specific training and doing it, it's one of the things that we do. The other thing is hygienists, you have, you, Doug, we do have to lead. Um, I find it's very difficult to um, to get a program together if the team doesn't buy in. And the challenge for hygienists is that they've been trained to pick up their instruments and start scaling as soon as the patient comes in because that's what the patient's in for to get their teeth cleaned. And to and for dentists and hygienists to stop and assess if what the, tre the treatment that they're in for today really has changed or is there a change in medical history or is there a change in the degree of disease that might necessitate several appointments for hygiene rather than one and to get off of this pro female on to providing a more comprehensive periodontal program is extremely important and I don't think we've emphasized that enough the impact it can have on your ROI when you start to get to a periodontal program. Dr. Bruce spared most productive dentist in the United States. He, he claims he bills $3,000 an hour, and I, I know him and know him well, and he does. Um, he had a 50% increase in his periodontal income in two months using some of the types of things we've talked about here when we introduced them to this to him. So there is a big ROI for the, for the practices, and there also is a good feeling that you're helping people get healthy. Everybody wins. And the hygienist department, the hygiene department, is a very uh, has a, a very frequently underutilized potential. I, I've had Rachel Wall on, and and she shared um, some stats with us in that regard. But you know, a lot of it is the internal communication too, because sometimes hygienists uh, are are being you know told not always verbally that they that they really shouldn't. Uh, uh, tread on the on the doctor's uh, turf, so to speak. They shouldn't, you know, get too involved in that. But uh, Joan Fitzgerald reminds us uh, that measuring blood pressure is the standard of care for the dental hygienist. So, you know, and, and in more yeah, ways than that. Danny, yeah. Danny, this is Doug. I'd like to add one more thing. There's a collaborative opportunity for the future that might be overlooked. And that is, uh, as uh, the Bale Donines of the world go out and teach people about heart attack and stroke prevention, uh, we shouldn't overlook the emergence of uh, telemedicine and collaborative physicians that you can give your you can you can share your patients with a, a physician phone number. Um, I do a lot of work with uh, Dr. Brewer down in Nashville, and you can give your patients a telephone number to a physician, and they can get help on the telephone. So we have a lot of neat opportunities that we didn't have just some years ago. So for collaboration, that's a that's something else to think about. Yeah, makes a lot of sense, and you know we should probably be aware if you're not that uh, there's an organization the American Academy of Private Physicians and uh, they're a pretty progressive group of physicians and uh, I haven't been to one of their meetings for a while but uh, they have speakers on telemedicine there like four years ago just giving you a glimpse of the future which is which is probably here now anyway so I think uh, I'm glad you that you mentioned that Doug uh, we have time for one more question um, and this has to do with the concept of disease masking. And I just wanted, I think this is uh, just, if you could quickly address it, Jim. Uh, in the context of the oral, biotic, oral antibiotic rinse, uh, you said it gets down six millimeters. Uh, what if there's an issue that's deeper than six millimeters? Do we run the risk of masking that disease by healing just the upper reaches of it? 
It depends on how you approach periodontal disease care treatment in the beginning. If someone has seven, eight, and nine millimeter pockets, before I begin treatment, I'm assessing, am I keeping those teeth? Can I keep those teeth? And uh, if there are hopeless teeth, and I would suggest at nine millimeters, you're approaching that, although lineup therapy can help tremendously, but it isn't always a predictable treatment and patients have problems because of the cost. Um, I prefer that hopeless teeth be removed before I begin care. Uh, I will be, I don't like to treat patients uh, if they have seven millimeter pockets using antibiotic mouthwashes. I think you need to have done some periodontal surgery first, and then you would use the antibiotic mouthwash in conjunction with your scaling, the root planing, disinfection of the mouth, and, the, and laser therapy to decontaminate, and use the antibiotic mouthwash at the end to reach into all of the sulci and to cleanse the entire mouth. So it's not an adjunct by itself. It is, a, it is a supportive adjunct to everything that you do, not a replacement for what you do. Got it. That's a very, that's very sound advice and, and makes sense. All right, gentlemen, Peter, Roger, Doug, and Jim, I want to thank you again very sincerely for what I knew would be a stimulating and uh, revealing 90 minutes together. And in a few days, you all, you would attendees will receive an email with instructions on how to receive your one and a half hours of CE credit. You'll also receive contact information for all of today's panelists should you want to continue the dialogue with them. Now, owing to a rather busy travel schedule, including our 20th annual Dentists Climb for a Cause hiking event in Provo, Utah, there will be no webcast scheduled for September. While the Climb for a Cause event has been closed to registration for quite a while, I invite everyone to learn more about our upcoming events at climbforacause.org. And if you're interested in a revealing and exciting CE course that's in partnership with Roseman University Health Sciences, I encourage you to visit climbforacause.org slash CE, or you can send me an email at director at climbforacause.org. In the meantime, I do want to thank again sincerely our distinguished panel, as well as my colleague, Virginia. She's also my wife and our newest addition to the ADM family, Karen Bloom, for their help in making this event possible. And of course, as always, thanks to all of you for your continued commitment to practice perfection. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.